Is he going to count down? Mark, are you going to count down? Okay. If you're ready, I'll give the thumbs up. All right, go ahead. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Riley. I'm the Director for Public Policy at Mozilla, and I am delighted to be able to introduce today's uh, April Speaker Series guest, Jennifer Granick. Uh, her title currently is the Civil Liberties Director at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. She's also a former Executive Director at that Stanford Center, as well as a former Civil Liberties Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Jennifer built her uh, incredible reputation defending hackers and freedom fighters, including many that, whose names you will recognize, like Kevin Poulsen, as well as Aaron Swartz. Um, in, in my mind, she is one of the earliest and one of the best thinkers at the intersection of technology and security and the law. Uh, she's one of the group of thought leaders, the very small group actually, um, who I followed personally in the early 2000s when I was still a computer scientist. And, and one of the people who I went to law school in order to join. And I'm incredibly proud to get to work with her on surveillance policy issues, security issues, um, and the other many things that are going on in the world today, which she will now talk about. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is a real honor to come here and talk to Mozillians about these important issues. Um, today I'm going to talk for a little bit about surveillance and some, uh, maybe a few other related things that we've been working on and I'm going to try to leave a lot of time for questions because I know that people are really interested in this topic and, and might have some things to ask. Um, so I am the Director of Civil Liberties at Stanford and I work on government surveillance. Um, I started back at Stanford in 2012 and I had some interesting important things that I was working on or so I thought. Um, but that was my life before Snowden. And when you're a surveillance expert, I think that all of us now think of our lives as before Snowden, then the Snowden period, and then after Snowden, and how we've been changed by that experience. Uh, and, and I can say that before Snowden, we were not totally ignorant. I mean, we knew that something was up, but we weren't exactly sure what it was. And so we were trying to figure out, we were trying to learn what it was. And we had our suspicions, but we didn't know really. So um, Senator Ron Wyden is um, one of uh, our heroes, one of my personal heroes. And he, um, as a former member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, was one of these people who actually was privy to at least some of the information that Snowden provided to us. Um, and so before the um, disclosures in June and July of 2013, um, Wyden was trying to um, help the um, other senators and the American public understand what it is that we were allowed to understand about the way that our government here in the United States collects information about us. And um, at a hearing, Senator Wyden asked the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, an important question. Um, and this was in March of 2013, and he said, Wyden said, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? Um, and uh, Clapper said, no, sir, not wittingly. Um, he sort of paused, and then he said, not wittingly. Um, and Wyden said, was like, is that your answer? And Clapper's like, that's my answer. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Um, and so those of us who are paying attention were like, huh, that's weird. You know, we already knew about some important stuff because in 2005, the um, New York Times had disclosed that there was warrantless wiretapping of Americans' communications going on um, and that they were wiretapping communications Americans had with um, particular countries that the Bush administration had identified as being involved in terrorism. And uh, after, subsequently, what happened is that in 2008, um, Congress eventually passed this law called the FISA Amendments Act that was supposed to regulate this formerly um, unregulated and illegal surveillance and uh, have it be targeted at um, you know, particular 
uh, ha have a more targeted program, with, which involved approval from the FISA court and that sort of thing. But people really didn't have a great idea how it worked. Those of us who are surveillance experts were saying we're afraid that there's too much collection going on under this law, um, but we, but you know we couldn't prove it. We didn't have the information. And here was Wyden asking this question: What kind of information could possibly be collected on millions of people? And Clapper saying, "Okay, it didn't happen." So we we're like trying to figure it out. Similarly, we were wondering, you know, does this law work? And so Mike Rogers, who was the head of the House Intelligence, Republican head of the House Intelligence Committee at the time, um, said, you know, they do not record your emails. None of that was happening. None of it, I mean zero. And I'm just going to emphasize here the zero, <laughs> okay? So that's what we were being told by experts and by people inside the government. None of this was happening, zero. They're not collecting information on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans. Okay, to middle of 2013, and here comes um, Edward Snowden. Um, you know, my daughters call him mommy's friend, Edward Snowden. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've never met him, but you know, if, if you, you know, it's like if you live your whole life and you're studying this issue of surveillance and you're concerned that the government is doing things that it shouldn't be doing and that it's out of control and you're being lied to repeatedly by that same government and then suddenly somebody comes forward and says, you know what, here is the information about your area of expertise that you didn't know that you need to know, like you like that. <laughs> you feel really, you feel you're like really grateful for that. And so I'm really grateful um, that I've learned these things. And one of the things that we learned from Edward Snowden um, is that there is a statute which authorizes the collection of data which is relevant to an authorized investigation to obtain foreign intelli intelligence information not concerning a U.S. person, or it has to be particularly about terrorism. And this statute, called Section 215, was being used to collect Americans' telephone records in bulk. In other words, all of our telephone records, domestic calling records, um, when we call each other, all of those records being funneled to the NSA and then to the FBI. So um, when Clapper said, we're not collecting information on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans, here's a statute under which information on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans was being collected. Um, you know, well, so what we uh, learned on, from Snowden is that, you know, the words that were being used to describe our law and our intelligence practices to the public were not way that we think of those words. They were not accurate. Um, so under Snowden, what we learned is A is not A. When somebody says something like um, target, that doesn't mean the um, person who is being surveilled. It means the thing you want to know about. Um, so I wrote uh, some about this in my book, American Spies. So I'm just going to read this part for people. And it's just brief, so don't, uh, don't feel like uh, I'm going to read for too long. OK. Um, Okay, so let me, so target is like, you think the target is who you're listening to, but it's what you want to know about. Um, so you think the word collect means when they gather information, but collect means when a human reads it. That's what Clapper said is the way he was using it. I, it's not collected until I read it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, minimize, which is what uh, a term, a legal term that people thought meant, oh, they get rid of stuff that they're not allowed to use. The minimization procedures are actually elaborate procedures about getting rid of some information, but also about how a lot of information is allowed to be used, disseminated, analyzed, and shared. Um, and when they talk about something like incidental collection, which sounds like there's only a few incidents of it, it actually means our communications are being collected all the time. Incident as in, you know, to the main collection, but it's happening all the time. Okay. so. What did Clapper have to say about this after Wyden asked him this question? It says, Clapper refuses to admit that he had lied to Congress. In an interview with NBC's Andrea Mitchell, he justified his answer with illegalism. He said, I responded in what I thought was the most truthful or least untruthful manner by saying no. Clapper indicated that his response to Wyden turned on a definition of collect. There are honest differences on the semantics of what, when someone says collection to me, that has a specific meaning, which may have a different meaning to him. In other words, Clapper said that collect doesn't mean acquire or gather. It means taking the book off the shelf and opening it up and reading it. 
And information isn't collected at all if it's a machine that's reading it or analyzing it, only if a human is. Um, so, you know, it's not a library collection when there's books on the shelves of the library. You're only collecting the book when, like, a hu when human eyes read it. Okay, that's not what anybody's real understanding of the word is. Um, but this is the way that language is being used inside the intelligence community, honestly, to befuddle the regulators and to befuddle the, the public. So Clapper didn't entirely make this up. Um, one of the points in my book um, it, that I try to make is that um, these surveillance decisions are not the choices of like a few bad people, right? This is a systemic problem um, that, and the failure to regulate it properly is a systemic problem we need to get involved in and fix the, the system. Um, and here's just an example. The Department of Defense Intelligence Handbook says information isn't collected until it's received for use by an employee of the DOD. And so he's using this uh, example that's in other kind of arcane secret documents in order to try to justify um, giving this particular answer on the record and sort of hiding from the public the fact that this is what's going on. Okay, so let's talk about incidental. Remember I said incidental makes it sound like there's a few instances of information being collected, but actually it means it happens all the time. So remember Mike Rogers, he said they aren't collecting your emails, zero of that is happening. Okay, well, after Snowden, um, there's this uh, push by the, um, by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the uh, other members of the intelligence community to be more transparent. Um, and I think from their perspective, like an honest to God effort to try to be more forthcoming, um, albeit not entirely forthcoming about what the uh, kind of surveillance is actually going on. And as part of that, and same thing on the part of the FISA court. So the FISA court is a collection of regular judges who are put together to consider uh, intelligence applications. And these judges um, issue orders as well as these more broad um, interpretations of law, which is, I don't think, originally what we imagined they would be doing. They're analyzing these programs. Um, and so one of these courts opinions was released recently, written by Judge uh, Hogan, and Judge Hogan talked about this idea of the collection of Americans' emails. So remember I said in 2005 we found out that warrantless email collection was happening. Um, in 2008, Congress passed a law called the FISA Amendments Act, which was supposed to regulate this collection of emails. It um, worried civil libertarians because we read the statute and we thought this could be meaning that when Americans talk to foreigners, our emails are collected without a warrant. Mike Rogers said it wasn't happening. Well, Judge Hogan, who oversees this program called Section 702, wrote in his opinion that Section 702 sweeps up substantial quantities of information concerning U.S. persons. Okay? Substantial quantities. Um, I think that's a lot more than zero. I wouldn't describe that with the word zero because it's, it's a lot. How much? Okay, so civil liberties advocates have been asking the director of national intelligence to tell us how much information they've been getting about Americans, um, and we've asked and they will not answer the question. They've alternately said um, it would be invading people's privacy for us to answer the question by counting. Um, it's too much for us to count. We can't tell you. Um, so they're um, basically continuing to resist giving us a fuller sense of how many Americans are caught up in this collection. Um, the only information we do have is, again, from Snowden, a uh, cache of communications collected under Section 702 um, was part of the documents that Snowden obtained. Um, it was given to reporters at the Washington Post, Bart Gelman, Ashkan Sultani, and uh, um, uh, I think the other reporter's last name name might be Tate, but I may, I'm sorry I'm forgetting her, Julia Tate, something like that. Anyway, I apologize to the other reporter for forgetting her name. But basically, they did an analysis of this data, um, which was collected under Section 702 and found that um, something like half of it was information to, from, or about Americans. 50% of it was to, from, or about Americans. And they found that um, nine out of 10 individuals mentioned in the trove of data were not the target. In other words, not the foreign intelligence target that was the purpose of the collection. 
So you've got a you know, one to 10 ratio, and then 50% of those are Americans, and it's Americans' information. So what they'll usually tell us now is, don't worry, we minimize that information, which makes you think that we're, make, we're minimizing it, we're making it smaller. So we're taking the information about Americans out or making it smaller in some way. Well, actually, that, again, is not the case. That's not what's happening. There's a thing that's uh, called backdoor searches. Senator Wyden calls backdoor searches. And what, basically what happens is this from Section 702, some of this information is collected from communications companies um, like Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Skype, Microsoft. And this information um, goes to the NSA purportedly for these foreign intelligence reasons, not purely terrorism or counterterrorism. And then this the information that comes from companies goes to the FBI. And the FBI is a domestic law enforcement agency. Okay? They're charged with, their responsibility is to investigate crimes. And so what they are allowed to do with this raw data, with Americans' names still in there, unminimized, not blacked out or anything, is search through the data looking for information. They can look for information by an American's name. They can search for all the words that say marijuana. We don't even know how they're using this trove of data. Um, they co-mingle it with other information that the FBI collects. And um, they are searching it without getting a search warrant. So no probable cause, no judicial supervision. And they are um, able to do those searches at an assessment level, which means basically you don't need any level of suspicion at all. It just needs to be for a legitimate government purpose. There's a story that came out today that suggests that they're searching this data for very low level routine crimes. Um, they're not talking about crimes that are like terrorism related, but very low level routine stuff. So repeatedly, um, the overseers, Congress and the um, intelligence committees have asked to learn more about the ways that the FBI uses this data. They say they need the information. Let's find out how they're using it so we can see if they do need it and if there's some way we can regulate it to make sure that it's not subject to abuse. Because I think the opportunities for abuse are pretty obvious here. And what the FBI has responded is, um, we can't give you a justification because uh, that would just be too much work. I mean, imagine if you had to explain every time before you did a Google search. It's just like, we're just searching it like you searched Google. And so like, it would be, it would suck for you if you had to explain why you were using a Google search. That's how much it would suck for us. It would just be like too time consuming. Too time consuming <laughs> to explain why you're searching for information in a trove, a trove of information about Americans. You know, it's supposed to be time consuming. We want you to think about it ahead of time. We want you to say, um, you know, if before I invade these people's privacy, before I read their emails, I do I have a good reason? Am I doing it for an appropriate purpose? Will this stand up in the court of public opinion? Is this just? Is it justified? But we can't, we have, first we have to get the government to be able to admit the numbers and to document, and that's not, that's not happening. Um, so, you know, basically what we learned from Snowden and the subsequent investigations is this statute that's supposed to be targeting the emails and phone calls of foreigners outside the United States for foreign intelligence purposes is resulting in this vast warrantless surveillance of Americans. So it's a big problem. Um, ultimately, I think there's a few conclusions you can draw from these two examples. And they're not the only examples of surveillance that's upsetting that we learned about um, from Snowden and from the subsequent investigations, but there's a couple of important things, I think, for people to remember. First, modern surveillance is mass surveillance. It used to be that governments did not collect much information on regular people. Governments were technologically limited in their capacity to spy. But now the government can collect vast amounts of information and then parse through it for matters of interest. Increasingly, protections against abuse, if there are any, operate after the fact. That means the US government used to lack the capacity for widespread abuse of information because it had limited the ability to collect the data. Now the government has limited permission to misuse the massive amounts of information it obtains by surveillance. I think anybody who's a parent knows the difference between having a baby who's unable to climb out of the crib and having a baby who doesn't have permission to climb out of the crib. So you can see what the difference is. You, you, it's a different world when you're living in a permission-based world than you're living in a capability-based world. Um, modern surveillance targeting foreigners has a huge impact on American privacy, despite the fact that these statutes are always described as tar targeting foreigners. 
third, spying is thriving, in part because of technology. Surveillance is defeating constraints posed by technology or economics. It used to be impossible to follow thousands of people all the time without anybody finding out. Now it's not only possible, it's cheap and easy. And spying is thriving not only because of technology, but also because of modern business, model, business models. Much of the modern privacy problem is the result of people giving up their data knowingly or otherwise to obtain cool new products or services. American spies are successfully deploying surveillance-friendly communications tools, even where we could have more privacy-protective ones. Um, and so, I mean, you guys know this. And here at Mozilla, a company that takes these values really seriously, when you think about how you create your products, how you create the browser, and you see in the ecosystem that you operate in, um, you're, we're living in a world that's awash with data. And sometimes it's necessary to share this data in order to get the cool product or service. Sometimes it's aspirational. Engineers think, it'd be cool if I had this data. I might be able to do something good with it. And sometimes it's just an ideal. It's just easier to keep it than it is to throw away. Well, we need to think about that with the backdrop of what, that the fact that the legal regime is not protecting this data, this data adequately. And um, ultimately, for lawyers, this is the part that you guys fight for that part. This is the part that I have to fight for. It's my part of the job um, is the law. Um, although, of course, all of you as citizens, it's actually your job too. So I am going to invite you to come and join me on this. The law has fallen way behind, right? Um, surveillance is regulated by a confusing patchwork of laws that fails to provide meaningful limits on government power and therefore invites abuse. After September 11th, laws that should have protected people's privacy and stopped abuses were weakened via the USA Patriot Act. But what happened beyond, even beyond that was that these new laws were then reinterpreted in secret to lower, the surveil to lower protections even further and to allow for things like this massive uh, collection of information. And then finally, modern surveillance depends on this untenable level of secrecy. Um, we live in a democracy. Right? Secret, this level of secrecy in a democracy where you don't know what your laws mean, you don't know what your government's doing, you don't know how they're spying on us, you don't know how they're using this information against us. When people are getting prosecuted, we don't know where that information came from. This is not how you run a democracy. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Um, that's the cover of my book. You can buy it. And there's little flyers around. I have a few if people want to buy one now. Um, Here's the things that I recommend for people to do. So I gave a TED talk at Stanford. It's like TEDx Stanford. And I gave a TED talk at Stanford the other day. And so I'm going to tell you uh, what I told the people in that audience that I think is really important. Number one, encryption. Use encryption. The reason why encryption is important doesn't protect everything all the time. But we are living in um, what I call the golden age for surveillance. I think it's Peter Swire's term. Information is cheap and easy to collect in mass, whether it's your face print or license plates or your email or your phone metadata or whatever it is. And what, techno what encryption does, whether it's end to end or not, is it rolls back the golden age for surveillance. It means that you can't just sit on the wire and collect everything anymore, right? You have to go to the endpoints. It, it, it pushes surveillance to be more targeted. So use encryption. Um, number two is, we have a rare opportunity this year. So if you have a friend or a relative who is a, uh, works for the French or the German government or is an in, works for an international human rights group or works for a global oil company or something like that, if they're a non-citizen and they're overseas, they're a legitimate foreign intelligence target. And when you talk to that person, your communications with that person might be collected. And then it may be in the trove of information that gets shuttled over to the FBI for the FBI to do these suspicionless searches through, these phishing expedition backdoor searches through. The law that allows this to happen is called Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. And that law is going to expire at the end of this year in December of 2017. This gives us a rare opportunity. The lackadaisical inertia of Congress for once is on our side, OK? So let's take advantage of that. Congress has to do something about Section 702 or it goes away. So this is an opportunity for us to push to reform it and to put safeguards in it that will protect people's privacy, not just Americans, but our foreign friends, too, who aren't doing anything having to do with terrorism or illegal activity or something like that, but to, but in, but to protect us as well and to protect our data. So, you know, 
whatever your favorite internet civil liberties group is that you join, you're gonna be hearing about section 702. Maybe it's gonna sound a little jargony. This is what it's about. And this is our rare opportunity. There's gonna come a time and people are gonna say, call your congressperson and tell them how you feel, write a letter or whatever. Let's do this thing, okay? Cause we have a rare chance. Otherwise we're gonna live with this for at least another five years. And then finally, we gotta fight secret law. You know, and I think um, one of the big uh, forces for fighting secret law has been companies. Companies like Mozilla, companies like Google, Yahoo at, at times, Microsoft coming forward and saying, you're bringing us these um, demands for information or you're doing something with or to our product that's affecting the privacy and security of our users and we wanna know about it. These ways that the government's operating shouldn't be secret. I mean, Mozilla just interceded in, uh, in a case involving, in the, the, the playpen child porn case, it was a case where there was a, um, a hacking, government hacking in order to obtain information about people who were thought to be trading child porn involving exploitation of a weakness in the Tor browser related to the Mozilla product. And the question is, what does the government know about the security of our product that it's not telling us so that we can fix it to protect all of our users? And Mozilla stood up and said, you know, we think if you know something about our product that affects our users' security and privacy, you should tell us so we can make it better, so we can fix it. That kind of stuff really makes a difference. That kind of stuff is really important. And so companies are one, including Mozilla, are one that stand have been standing up and saying, um, you know, we're not here to be pawns in a secret game. We're important actors here and you need to communicate with us like the, um, you know, like the lawful citizen and, you know, b businesses and important parts of this polity that we are. Um, same thing in other contexts. There's laws, the, you know, the interpretations of Section 702 and Section 215 have been secret. People like Clapper and Rogers have issued these misleading statements that don't explain to Americans exactly what it is. Um, we live in a democracy. You can't have secret law in a democracy. That is just anathema. It can be secret who you target, but it can't be secret what the law allows and how that information is processed. That's just not what it means to be in a democracy. So that's the stuff that um, you know we're fighting for at the Center for Internet and Society. It's stuff that you guys are fighting for too. This year is a really special year to try to do this. So let's get this done. The end. <laughs> And I didn't say anything bad about Trump. Because most this was written with Obama under Obama. You know, all of this stuff, all of this stuff happened, you know, under uh, George W. Bush and Obama. I wrote it with the anticipation, reasonable at the time, that Hillary Clinton would be our next president. You know, with things with Trump are obviously, you know, we're living in a different world. We have a president who prides himself on getting even, um, who says, you know, if somebody hits you, you hit them back five times harder than they ever expected. And this massive amount of information, private information about Americans is under his control as president. That information could be repurposed from the FBI looking for evidence of minor crimes to some kind of political uh, retaliation against people who oppose or challenge. So this is, this is like, this is the crunch point people. This is where we got to do something. Any questions or Thank you so much. Or... <laughs> yes. So um, questions are open in Air Mozilla. So please send your questions to me in Air Mozilla. I think we might have some in the room to start with. I see. So I'll, I'll go first to, with this jaw box thing here. It's um, like the conch shell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's funny you can throw it across there. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the concerns and the talk and a lot of your focus has been on Americans and, and the like clear violations in the law that many of us see here. Um, what about for non-Americans? Like certainly the, the minimization procedures such as they are don't even apply there and, and the situation seems much worse and also seems like very, very uh, much reason to worry. Is there anything that we can or should be working on in this context? Um, what's the landscape look like a little bit uh, for non-Americans who are, whether they're communicating with Americans or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for my, our, our non-American friends, I, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> um, so I think one, one opportunity is the Section 702 reform. Because right now, um, we're collecting, without a warrant, communications of foreigners reasonably believed to be overseas 
about any foreign intelligence topic, which is really broad. It's the price of oil. It's, you know, what's this uh, civil liberties? What's this, what's, you know, this international civil liberties group up to? What's the UN going to do? It's like, it's really broad. There's one possible reform is to narrow the scope of Section 702 so that it really is only about um, counterterrorism, uh, weapons proliferation, you know, so, and, and maybe like government, what, what government actors are doing, particular government policy or something. And so narrow it to um, basically exclude, make it less likely that we're capturing information from your average foreigners. We can also, you know, think about having the minimization procedures be more um, for foreigners also narrow or make sure we can't use and we have to delete or get rid of information that's not about uh, that's not about national security right now you know the information about foreigners can be used for all kinds of things but if we narrow those topics it'll not only help americans because it'll protect us when we're talking to our foreign friends about whatever it'll protect those foreigners as well i expected i mean i'd be curious if you have a, a response to this um chris i expected that the europeans would pressure the, uh, the americans more on this issue. Um, there is uh, this privacy shield, which is the negotiation between Europe and the United States over what the way that we'll treat data of Europe that belongs to Europeans when American companies collect it. And the privacy shield is this renegotiation after the previous privacy arrangement um, fell apart. Um, Max Schrem sued Facebook and said, this doesn't protect our privacy, Europeans' privacy enough. That deal fell apart and the privacy shield is supposed to be improved version. So I'm surprised how uh, this Section 702 stuff hasn't been a uh, like a, an interference in having the privacy shield be approved. But it seems like everything's sort of rolling along, and it's not going to be. And I, I'm not. I don't know exactly why that is. But I think Europeans, in particular, have an opportunity with the formation of the privacy shield to say, you know, all signs point to our information being misused and uh, you know not used for for uh, you know important government interests under this regime, so let's do something about it. Um, so again, there, I think we have another opportunity. Hey, anything in the room? Do we have any, oh, I see one back there. Um, so thank you, that was wonderful. <clears throat> you know, Chris introduced you with all of your accomplishments and as a member of the elite, and we've been talking about the highest level of the NSA and this very elite stuff. And when you say things like democracy is not supposed to work that way, I think, well, how does it actually work for most people normally? And when you talk about the need to make change and you talk about Mozilla and Mozilla's need to get involved, which is awesome and I completely support and I want to do it, I think, what are the actual politics among millions of voters that would actually affect the changes that you want? And I'd love to hear if you or anybody else is working on getting actual pressure, not on Senator Wyden, who believes in this because it's his thing, but on J. Random Senator, who is answering to their constituents who are getting their information from CNN. Yeah, great. So great question. Um, you know, <clears throat> we are living in an age of activism now. And I think we are all activists in a way that we haven't maybe been till recently. Um, and I think that's true across the political spectrum. You know, whether you're um, fighting to keep uh, funding in public schools, whether you're pro or against gun rights, um, and whether you're, you know, marching with Occupy Wall Street or with Black Lives Matter, or you're one of the millions and millions of Americans who came out for the Women's March this past January. The American public is activated politically in a way that I think is really new. And I think in particular, Republicans are paying more attention to surveillance, rightly or wrongly, actually wrong, they're rightly paying more attention, but for the wrong reasons, um, because of these concerns that, as Trump said, that Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. I think you heard the extra P in how I said wiretapped. Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. Obama didn't wiretap Trump Tower, but the uh, and the and you know we had conversations between Michael Flynn and um, and the Russian ambassador. You know, the Russian ambassador is a legitimate foreign intelligence topic, and if you're an American who talks to him about things that where it's important that we know the American's name, that's going to happen. That's, you know, sort of, it's always, that's pretty basic. But, but Republicans are concerned, too. They're paying attention to surveillance in particular in a particular way. So I think we are living in a time of some real political engagement 
on the part of Americans that we haven't necessarily seen before and that people realize, you know, on the, you know, from left to right, that surveillance is like too much surveillance can undermine your activism and your goals, whatever your issue might be. And so I think we're, I think that we're, I think we have that, I think we have that opportunity. Now, this isn't the focus of like what the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford does. I laughed when you said elite, but I have to like, that's, I totally see why <laughs> it's an accurate word. Um, but, you know, there are lots of grassroots groups out there from membership groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation to groups that are, you know, very much about bringing in uh, regular people into the political process, like Fight for the Future or Demand Progress or, you know, I apologize to everybody I'm not going to mention, but there's a lot out there now. Um, and so I think that we are seeing like a lot of engagement and I think it's for real for people just even for regular people. Do you think so? <laughs> he didn't have the microphone, but he, for those who didn't hear, he said, no, he doesn't, he doesn't think so, but he appreciates the answer. <laughs> Some people have called me irrationally optimistic, but we'll see. Let's discuss this in five years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Someone there's commented someone in, the, oh, is there someone back there? Okay, I'm gonna, there's one comment in the thread and then we'll get to you, Venetia. Um, but I, I'd love your comment on this comment, but someone in the discussion said, um, um, there are agreements for other countries to spy on US citizens and in turn, Americans can spy on their citizens, especially with, among US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand, and they linked to something called Five Eyes. Is this something you're aware of? Maybe if you so that, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. So, so the Five Eyes is a pact between these five English-speaking countries to collaborate or cooperate on surveillance. And at least initially, it was a promise not to spy on each other's citizens. Um, although in more recent times, we've seen signs that we are doing some spying on British citizens and doing some data exchange. But the idea was more, um, we're going to all spy on France and Germany, and then we're going to trade the data and share it. And so this was this, this agreement that, that we had with them. Um, you know, those allegiances, those spy allegiances are still strong um, but you know we don't know all the details about how they work but we do have signs that five eyes far from protecting us from UK spying is actually you know maybe enabling uh, the worry is that it enables us to get information the U the, it enables the United States government to get information that it wouldn't ordinarily be allowed to collect on Americans by letting the uh, British do their rampant spying and then, um, you know, giving it to the, to the Americans. I will say that at least some countries have anti-spying laws or spying regulation laws that protect the rights of non-citizens and foreigners and that they treat people like people um, and not have this idea that, like, if you're not a citizen of that country, then tough for you. You don't get any rights under our laws. Um, it's sort of a more human rights kind of conception. And so I, I hope that um, we'll move towards that and then, you know, these international agreements will be more collaborate, will, will be what I think they were intended to be, which was collaborations um, among like-minded countries for like-minded for, for like -minded legitimate national security goals as opposed to what we fear is happening, which is they are somehow a backdoor arrangement to get around things that are supposed to be protecting us from, gov from government spying. Yeah. Hi. Um, you talk about regular people and however we define it, we can kind of talk about that. But one of the common things we hear about from all the from people all the time is I have nothing to hide. Um, and it's good for the government to be looking at our details because it keeps us safe. What might your arguments or support be for a statement like that, that the regular people, everyday people always say? Yeah. So I have a big chapter in my book on this. Uh, which I'm not going to read to you, but you can. I could read part of it now as the answer, but you, but in my book I address this. But let me sort of sum it up in in two ways. So number one, um, everyone has something to hide from someone. Like you don't want your mom to know what you said. Um, you know your kid hates this other kid at school. You hate that other mom. You're looking for another job and your boss doesn't know. Um, you you did something really embarrassing and you just don't want to confront it with your neighbors. Whatever it is, everybody has something that they want to hide from from someone and that type of information that's just normal life and that information is the, the problem with that is that if somebody has that information about you they have leverage over you they might have leverage over you um, and that's a that's a concern um, the other part of the answer is um, don't be so selfish it's not all about you you know we're not worried about like me let's say I'm worried about the next Martin Luther King 
I'm worried about the leader of uh, Black Lives Matter. I am worried about the senator who's pushing for um, health coverage or the person who's trying to fight for funding in public schools. If the government has information that's embarrassing, if, if people who oppose that guy in the government or woman in the government have information that's embarrassing, they can try to blackmail that person into not supporting political goals that I, I may value. And that is the real, and we've seen that all throughout the 70s, that's what was going on. That's what happened with Dr. Martin Luther King. The FBI wiretapped his hotel rooms and tried to um, get him to uh, stop his advocacy for civil rights, if not to kill himself. They sent him a letter that seemed to encourage him to kill himself because they had evidence that he had been um, unfaithful to his wife. They uh, ha had senators who they would um, say, okay, we know you drove drunk or you also cheated on your wife or whatever. So, you know, we never had any problems from that guy on the Appropriations Committee ever again, which is a quote from, uh, from uh, FBI Director Hoover's right-hand man. And, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not about you. The political process can't work. People can't freely advocate for what's important to them and for policies if someone in the government has all this dirt on them. And so that's one of the main things we have to worry about. Okay. Uh, we had another one come in on the Chinsum, and then we have one more in the room. Um, how can we work to encourage the destruction of existing data stores? And since much of this data is stored on Oregon soil, could we leverage Oregon law and legislation? In Oregon? Yeah, this comes from our <laughs> Portland office. Oh, very good. <laughs> wow, I mean, it sounds like they know something about Oregon law that I don't know. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, destroy, destroying data, if we have rules that say the data has to be destroyed and we can check, we can try to do that. I don't know what the Oregon, I, I don't know what, the, what exactly the circumstance is, but um, you know, I think the ultimate problem is if you're talking about federal surveillance, um, and I've talked a lot about federal surveillance, then I don't think state law is going to be able to force the destruction of federal databases wherever the information might currently be, be stored. But I do think there's like a lot of room for innovation in the states um, to talk about how we deal with surveillance that affects lots and lots of people. Um, the ACLU of Northern California is just like a couple blocks, uh, a couple blocks uh, north of here. And, you know, California, so I'm going to talk about California. Sorry, Oregon, like I know Oregon's a leader as well, but I just know California law a little better. And California has been a real leader in things like red light cameras, license plate detection, um, you know, uh, wiretapping, um, e email collection and has passed statutes like Cal ECPA that um, provide more privacy protection for people who live in this state than um, for than the federal government federal law uh, applies. And these are examples. These are um, you know we're a laboratory in these states, and we can set an example and show this is how you protect uh, public interests and you protect privacy and security and they work together just fine and there's not an opposition. And so I think when we do things like regulate, you know, street cameras or facial recognition or license plate detection or, um, you know, fingerprinting or, or mug shots or whatever it is in the states, we set an example for the rest of the country and we can say, you know, California's data breach notification law, which lets people know if their information was stolen was a model for the rest of the country. Now almost all the states uh, have one and there's a proposal to have one in the, in the, uh, at the national level as well. You know, we are setting an example. So I think that's important. I don't, um, I'm not that optimistic that state legislation will stop federal surveillance programs, but state legislation can be a, um, you know, the sort of the point of the sword. Okay, I think over there, Chris. <laughs> I'm always afraid to throw at each other. <laughs> so I want to I want to take this in a little bit of a different direction as well. Um, I was giving a speech last week, uh, not about security, but to a, a group of computer science students who were very interested in security. And they asked me a question. I'm going to repurpose it to you, and then I can figure out, you know, whether I messed it up when I answered it. <laughs> uh, what's your take on hackback? It's, it's a little bit of a spin, right? But it's a, it's a very controversial part of this space. Um, and maybe you could give a little bit of context for it as well. Yeah, so hack back is the idea that um, if you are, your systems are, uh, are uh, compromised by an attacker, 
um, your, as part of the idea of defending yourself, you can compromise the attacker's systems and um, either disable that system or collect information there, um, which could be used to identify the attacker or disable them or prosecute them or, or something like that. Um, I think this is a little bit of a surprise because I'm such a, uh, a, a liberal on, on computer access. You know, I fought the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for the entirety of my legal career. It's the law that I've hated the most for, you know, as long as I've actually been a, uh, pretty much as long as I've been a, a, an attorney. And um, I, my ideas have always been that, you know, people should be more free to explore the computer networks that surround us and to gather information from them. Um, but I'm against hackback, and I am against it for uh, for uh, for for one main reason, I guess, which is that you know you don't know when a computer is attacking your system. You don't know uh, anything necessarily about that computer system. Um, it could be the computer of an innocent third party that's just been taken over as part of a botnet or has been compromised to be a zombie in the part of the attack. Um, so when you, and you don't know what the configuration is. So when you take information from that computer or you disable that computer, you could be causing this ripple effect of harm down the road that shuts down a business, that shuts down a hospital, that shuts down a school, or you could be getting private information about you don't even know who it is. So I'm, I think of it as, um, you know, sort of People, I think the good word for it would be self-help. I think of it, for me, it's like a vigilanteism, and I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, it's a healthy practice. I don't think it's something that, that we should be doing. I don't think it's something we should be sanctioning. What did you say, Chris? Something very simple, but it's really concerning that it's hard to know. Uh, like, if, if less to Do you want the... Yeah, well, Largely similar. The other thing that I said was if we got to a point where this was something that was accepted and blessed the, and, and something that occurred a lot and was a regular practice, I, I can't imagine the destabilizing effects on the Internet that could result if this happened in, in en masse. I think that's absolutely right. And th this is one of the reasons why I am not also not a fan of just so I'll take it in another direction in case people want to talk about this. I'm also not a fan of, of government hacking. The idea that, you know, one of the, so we have this massive surveillance, more people are using encryption and hiding their information from opportunistic collection. In some cases, encryption means that data that might be relevant to a crime is not capable of being collected at all because it's encrypted. And the, uh, we don't know how often that's true or what the actual impact of that is, but the policy solution that's most often presented in response to this increasing encryption going dark problem is government hacking and the idea that will empower um, investigators to gain access to people's computers or phones and get information out of it that way. And I'm not a fan of government hacking for exactly this destabilizing reason. I don't think that what security needs is more people breaking into more computers and taking data. Um, you know, particularly when it's private computers or private machines. I feel differently about computers that are connected to the, to the Internet. You connected your computer to the Internet. It's a web server. You configured it wrong. I saw private data. I don't think I should be punished for looking. But the idea that we're going to basically have teams of um, investigators, San Francisco Police Department is going to have tools that are going to let it break into San, you know, people's machines, um, makes me very uncomfortable because I exactly because I think it's very destabilizing for for security, I, and I think ultimately it doesn't have the effect of promoting security. I think it ultimately is destabilizing. So we have a question in Portland, I believe. Microphone there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Is this on? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Um, so uh, one thing that you mentioned was the potential for. Uh, these troves the, of data that the government has collected to be used for personal vendettas and to be used for political lobbying. And you gave examples of just using traditional, um, you know, information against Martin Luther King and people like that. Um, do you know of any cases yet where these troves have been used in that way, where the electronically, where the surveillance data has been used to, you know, to influence politicians or to, you know, to, to influence uh, political activity? Um, so I know that 
uh, I know that um, there have been uh, efforts to, so, okay, so politicians, I don't know standing here, but I know that we have, we have seen and have documented examples of um, investigators spying on um, like uh, Quaker groups that resist uh, military recruiting in high schools, spying on, yeah, is that, are you a Quaker? There's some Quakers here who are literally quaking. <laughs> uh, I, know that, I, I know that we've seen um, spying on Muslim community groups reading lists. We've seen targeting certainly of mosques and uh, you know, sending investigators in to spy on mosques and report people there for um, saying something inappropriate or for maybe not being a citizen. The New York Police Department has been very active in spying on Muslim groups. We've seen infiltration of Occupy Wall Street and of Black Lives Matter. Um, and we've seen government statements from like joint task forces, which are alliances between local, state, and federal government saying things like, you know, to look out for domestic terrorists, we need to watch out for people who um, vote for third party candidates, who own a don't tread on me flag, who watch this particular anti tax movie. Um, we've seen the IRS. Uh, disproportionately audit groups that um, have Tea Party or Patriot in their name. Um, so, you know, these are things that have leaked out and, you, and yet we, we have this information. So there's a lot more. If you look at um, Inspector General reports on um, fusion centers um, and some of the other reports, you'll see that we have a, a lot of examples of um, this kind of targeting or investigation of groups for, for political um, or for religious activity. Um, but remember, you know, with the, the evidence, the examples I talked about from the 70s, those examples are documented um, because the Congress had these committee, committees, the Church Commission, that basically forced government agents to come forward and testify under oath and under cross-examination and were subpoenaed to bring documents with them. And we were able to document this stuff that had been happening for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years prior. Um, this is the stuff we know about without an extensive investigation. Um, and so I, you know, you, I've given you a few examples. There's a lot more examples that are public, um, but the worry is that even that is just the tip of the iceberg. So this is a segue, I think slightly. Um, so the question is, is my understanding is that there's broad support in the US for this level of spying because of political and media stereotyping of certain groups like Muslims. What can technologists like Mozilla do to reduce the demand for spying based on stereotypes? That's a great question. I don't usually, you know, I, I'd be curious what the what the questioner thinks is the is a potential answer because, you know, when I think about what technologists can do, I think about what you do as part of your design of the products that you make. And I think about what you do as a political force, you know, as a member of the, you know, as an actor in the economy um, to say, you know, this is, that we have this uh, expertise in areas touching on technology, but, uh, you know, I can make it more general. What should people do to address dis uh, discriminatory values or discriminatory ideas in society so that we don't think of particular groups um, as being, um, you know, as being terrorists and not worthy of, um, of protection. And I, I don't, you know, there are other people who do this kind of work. I did this TED talk over the weekend and there was a woman there who talked about the Muslims you don't see. And she had, you know, sort of examples of all the different countries, all the different um, um, religious beliefs, all the different um, styles of dress, all the different appearances, all the different complexities of the Muslim community around the world and how unaware um, particularly maybe Americans are because we have this portrayal um, that's so like one-sided where like Muslim men are dangerous and Muslim women are oppressed and that's like basically all we know. Um, so I think reaching out to groups who were, who are concerned with this sort of thing and who like are basically um, trying to help make there be more variety in the media and also trying to help educate people, give our kids better books to read about people who are different from us and that sort of thing is really important. But that is not something that I personally am an am a expert in. I think it's really important. 
Yeah. We have another one. Have there been any efforts to reduce the amount of years that ISPs, internet service providers, can retain um, the data about their customers? For example, I believe most IR ISPs are required to keep all their customers' internet history for at least seven years. Any understanding? No, you're not aware of that. That's not yes. true. Okay, that's not <laughs> that's true. Not true. That's there, good. Is, there is one requirement. <laughs> I think that phone companies, for billing purposes, are required to keep calling records for 18 months or something like that. And that's the only data retention obligation that I'm aware of in for you know in the United States. We don't have data retention obligations. Um, and so we but we also don't have data deletion obligations um, either. We don't have you have to get rid of it by this point in time. Um, and it's if we're lucky it'll stay that way. <laughs> I don't see us getting data deletion obligations. And I think a lot of companies, to be honest, I think a lot of company, companies would probably resist that because I think the idea is um, we don't know now what kind of data we might need in the future in order to be innovative. So. All right. Yeah. I think we're. Well, we're at the end of our hour, so I'm going to stand up here and, and thank Jennifer again. Thank and you. Hope everyone else will for uh, Thanks spending for having the time me. with us. Thank you for having me, everybody. Thank you for having me, everyone out there. Check out America. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So quiet. <laughs> yes. You can see. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jennifer.